Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all participants from our second panel of the fifth BRICS conference in the University of Sao Paulo. It's such a pleasure to moderate this panel, this distinguished panel uh, with um, professionals, professors from India, Russia, and South Africa. It's a, 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 an honor to be here with you. I would like to thank also all participants and mainly our, uh, our supporters here uh, for this event. Without, those, without this support, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to manage this. So uh, on behalf of Gebrix, USP, and on behalf of Paulo Borba Casella, I would like to, uh, I would like to thank uh, CIARB, uh, which is the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the Forum for Global Studies, uh, the BRICS IAA, where uh, FGS is represented here in this panel with Mr. Sandip, BRICS IAA with Mr. Alexander Cornishin, the Embassy of India, the Embassy of China, uh, the SABIA, the South, Af the South African BRICS Youth, Youth Agency, uh, OAB, the, the, the International, International, Commu International Affairs Commission of our OAB here in Brazil, Ligi China, and of course, Ibra China, uh, uh, all great partners of our JBRICS, and Ibra China especially for hosting us in your, in your YouTube channel. Uh, we are uh, beginning our second panel here of the BRICS conference and uh, the global uh, issue that we are going to address here with our distinguished uh, panelists is energy and industrial revolution. Uh, we know that uh, energy is becoming more and more important in a, in a, digital, in a digital and electronic world um, uh, we demand more and more uh, energy efforts, energy efficiency, and we can. Uh, we are going to discuss here in our panel some of those efforts, some initiatives, and some topics that would be uh, interesting uh, for for everybody who's participating here with us. So once more, thanks on behalf of the University of our GBRIX and on behalf of Professor Paulo Borba Casella. And we are going to start uh, this, uh, this panel uh, with the presentation of Professor Sandeep Tripathi. Sandeep Tripathi, <clears throat> just a second. Sandeep Tripathi is a founder and president at the Forum for Global Studies, FGS in New Delhi. He is also working as a director of research and collaboration at Law College Dehandrum, Uttaranchal University, India. Sandy, I'm sorry if I misspelled or if I said anything uh, uh, in an improper way because my Hindi is not so developed as uh, Mr. Cassio's uh, Hindi. <laughs> but uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, take your time. And we are very anxious to hear your always insightful words. Thank you, uh, Josh Nantala, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to be here at the fifth uh, <clears throat> BRICS conference at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I'm so happy uh, to uh, participate in this uh, a second panel, uh, no, a fifth uh, <clears throat> a BRICS conference uh, with having a uh, distinguished panelist with uh, uh, Alexandra from the Russia and Pihu Matthew from the South Africa. And of course, my friend, my colleague, uh, today's moderator of this program, uh, Jose Nantala from uh, Brazil. Uh, so I'm so thankful for inviting me here. <clears throat> In today's, uh, uh, in today's uh, uh, program, my topic uh, would be uh, energy, uh, geopolitics of energy, uh, fueling international politics. 
and under this topic i will uh, flag off uh, uh, three major issues uh, in international politics re regarding energy and geopolitics so i will flag a uh, first issue oil and gas are the strategic asset in international politics second uh, the role of interdependence among states and is it a guarantee for peace uh, I will explain uh, it this uh, point through the new liberal perspective of international relations. Now, the third point, the last point would be my discussion. Russia's energy resource as a tool of political influence. I will explain this topic in a realistic perspective. So three uh, major areas uh, which I'm going to discuss uh, during this uh, <clears throat> And a second panel session of the uh, fifth BRICS conference. So uh, let me start energy, uh, geopolitics of energy as a, as a strategic commodity in international politics. <clears throat> so as far as energy is concerned, energy is fundamental to our civilization and it has become a lifeline for all nation states. Its production, distribution, and utilization are deeply embedded in the fabric of geopolitics. While well, identifying uh, no, a state's power, it's, it's, it's a national power, a realist scholar, Hans Morgan Thau notes, I quote, geography, national resources, natural resources are the basic component of any nation state's power. So uh, in that context, uh, we can say that uh, energy resources has become an important variable defining the positioning of states uh, uh, position in the global affairs. Let me quote a uh, strategic scholar, Michael T. Clare, I quote, the potential great power war might erupt for the control of natural resources. And here, I would like to cite the uh, uh, cite the uh, Persian Gulf War, 1990. Uh, it, the Persian Gulf War, 1990, can be cited in this context uh, where Operation Desert Storm was launched by the U.S., United States, and its uh, allied forces against the Iraq. And finally, Iraq was defeated. It was not an a geostrategic alliance. It was something, it was something that the United States sought to preserve its energy resources, sought to secure its energy market. And that is why on the request of Quebec and you know, Saudi Arabia, United States started war against Iraq, though it looks like a geopolitical war, but it was not something geopolitical, it was something the economic factor that fuels geopolitics. So we can say the geopolitics, geoeconomics get together simultaneously. So uh, in that sense, uh, we can say that uh, it, has, it is not only the item of international trade in the world economy, it has some sense of a strategic value. In that sense, I would like to quote again, a GLAPT A Korean, I quote, through history, Certain commodities, and in particular energy commodities, minerals, water, food, have, ha have had a strategic value beyond their market price, and such they have been repeatedly used as a tool of foreign policy by the exporters and have been among the prime catalyst of armed conflict. So this is for something that energy is something beyond the market price. And in that sense, I think the 20th century, the mid from uh, onwards the mid 20th century after the Second World War, during the Cold War period, and even the post Cold War period, two days, regarding the energy as a strategic commodity, the energy supply disruption, price hikes, and alternative transit routes are used as a strategic commodity to advance geopolitical interest of a nation states. And uh, let me, uh, let me uh, figure out on facts that how does it work in international system? 
There are the uh, three uh, main players in this uh, game. One is a country which is uh, a country which is uh, gifted with the energy, that is uh, energy producer country, energy supplier country, the first player. And the second player is something which is consuming, a consumer country. And of course, this portion is very big in the in, in, in entire the global arena because a very few countries gifted with the, uh, this natural resource, oil and gas. So this second one is the con, you know, consumer countries. And the third one is, third one goes to transit states. And the something is a very you know, natural gift. This is the natural gift. For example, the Ukraine position between the Euro, uh, European Union and the Russia is a transit country. So this geographical position makes a very, very important uh, role in defining the state's position. So there are basically three uh, actors uh, in this energy global structure. One is energy supply and another is, second is energy uh, consumer countries and the third one transit countries. And all, and all three players view this energy security in their respective domain. For example, uh, those countries which are energy supply, they, they, they want, a secure market, they want a reliable market. And the second, uh, energy security for energy producer, uh, no, uh, consumer country, they want uh, uh, a very you know, a reliable you know, uh, supply country. Uh, they, they need a, a reliability of the supply country. So for consumer country, uh, they need a, a, a stable supplier position. And for the supplier country, they need a very stable consumer. And the third one is the transit country. The transit country, it, it seeks to maintain, it seeks to avoid the alternative transit rules. So energy security has a different connotation for the different three players. One seeks to maintain security of supply. One seeks to, another wants to secure security of demand. And another last the transit country seeks to secure not to diversify transit routes. So this is something uh, that we can say here, energy is something at the strategic committee. Now the second portion, uh, which I would like to highlight here, uh, uh, the new liberal perspective. A new liberal perspective in international relations theory, it, it talks about you know, uh, inter interdependence. And let me quote uh, uh, Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen. Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen both strongly believe that this in, uh, the, the world is getting more and more independent in terms of the economy. And sometimes it becomes not only interdependent, it becomes as a complex interdependence. And this case is uh, applicable uh, with the European Union and the Russian Federation. I'll, I'll highlight this, uh, this new liberal perspective in EU and Russian uh, uh, context, uh, where it works. So now the question is, if the economy is interdependent, if economy is intertwined to each other, does it ensure the peace and prosperity? Does it, does it, does it ensure the stability between the two you know, two actors during a time when the actor is known as a geopolitical rivals. This is the question. This is the point. And this theory strongly believes, yes, deepening economic engagement, it diffuses. First, deepening economic engagement, it creates a mutual dependence. And this mutual dependency leads certain equations, certain results. The certain result is it diffuses the arc geopolitical rivalry. It diffuses the frozen conflict between the two actors. And it, and it happened last seven, eight years following the Ukrainian crisis. So this, uh, the, 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 so the question does it ensure? Answer is yes. After the sanction 
over the sanction on Russian Federation by the EU along with the United States. There is still economic engagement and this engagement can be seen in the three proper you know, uh, uh, scenario. The first is the diversification policy that has been miserably failed from both sides, from the European Union and from the, of course, the Russian side. And the second one is trade relation between the European Union and the Russian Federation. And of course, the third one is, which is most important, most contested issue in the current realm of international politics is Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 <laughs> gas pipeline that was proposed by both Germany and the Russian Federation. So all three, you know, all three, uh, you know, all three illustrations justify that yes, new liberal perspective of international relations is still exist. Let me uh, one by one, let me uh, uh, flag off one by one. First, a diversification policy. Following the Crimean crisis, uh, uh, you know, you know, European Union started uh, uh, looking for energy security towards the Middle East. But the Middle East, politically and geographically, it is, uh, it is, you know, it is not a, uh, you know, a feasible. It is not a, a reasonable choice for the European Union as the reliability of the supply of uh, natural gas. So, in terms of the security of supply, that is the questionable. Regarding the, regarding the uh, uh, geographical position and the political uh, no, question. The politically, Arab states are unstable, and geographically, it's not so close as the Russian protection. So, research geographical proximity, existing infrastructure, and the energy of value, it makes the Russia is inhabitable choice of the European Union. Russia is an unavoidable choice for the European Union. Russia is something that cannot be denied by the European Union. Even in, even in the current phase, like you know, European Union started looking for the uh, liquefied natural gas LNG for the you know, United States. It's still, despite the scenario, diversification from the European Union side miserably failed. And the, let me let me let me highlight the, some fact in the figures. The one fact that in, two, in 2020, 40 percent of its natural gas, European Union imported 40 percent of its natural gas from the Russian Federation. This is the reality of geoeconomics. This is the reality of deeper economic engagement that that overrules the political you know, political issues. One. And the second is 27% you know, uh, European Union uh, ex, you know, imported oil from the Russian Federation. So this is, uh, this is something that makes vulnerable position of the European Union. And, uh, and this situation doesn't give any choice. Geopolitically, it, it, it doesn't give, sorry, economically, it doesn't give any choice for the European Union. One, I'm just coming from the Russian side. As the science zone over the science zone from the United States and the European Union, Russia, you know, Russia, Russia started, uh, no, uh, Russia started realizing vulnerable position politically, and Russia started looking for the, you know, uh, for the as a reliable customer because uh, we know the Russian economy is based on the petro, petro based economy. And in, in, in the global arena, if Russia is something just because of its gas, oil and gas. So Russia started looking towards China, setting itself footing set in the MENA region, as well as establishing itself as a major supplier of gas to the China. Russia wanted to signal European Union that yes, Russia had a choice as a reliable customer. But my dear friend, Geopolitical, this is not true. Economically, it is, sorry, economically, it, it, it has a, a valuable cost for the Russian Federation because EU 
you know, China cannot be you know, replaced the EU choice. EU is European Union is European Union. The Chinese market cannot replace, and that is why. Geopolitically, China does not you know, take Russia as an emerging power. So there is, so you know, Russian, uh, Russians, uh, continuous uh, putting in the Chinese markets, that is not a viable choice for the Russian tradition. Yes, this is somewhat the complex interdependency. Interdependency is the universal from both uh, no, actors, but this interdependency leads complexity. Complexity, I mean here, Russia has no choice except EU. And EU has no choice except to Russia. So this is you, this is a win situation for both actors in the international political economy. Second example, this is the first example that establishes the new liberal perspective of the Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen. The second example, the trade. 2000, uh, in 2019, 199. Billion, uh, no, a billion cubic meters of gas supplied to the European Union. And in 2020, uh, there is still the proper, uh, no, still, you know, uh, EU, is, EU is the largest trading partner of the Russian Federation. That is amazing. Despite have the political sanction, sanction over the sanction, Followed by the you know, uh, United States, EU is, EU, EU is still the largest trading partner. This is the reality of geoeconomics. And the third one is Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 you know, is a very fascinating story of this gas pipeline. That, no, that, that gets accounts that, yes, in, geo, in, in, in geoeconomics, Sometimes you don't have any choice. Germany is the single country that has initially. Let me let me let me uh, remind the one fact. The Crimean the Crimean crisis started 2014, and the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline started 2016. Just after one year later. And Nord, Nord, Stream, yes, to Nord Stream gas pipeline too, it was the determined position of the German. US has been very, very susceptible. And initially during the Trump administration, it imposed political sanction, imposed political sanction on Nord Stream uh, you know, company, AG company in German company, and imposed sanction on the Russia. Eastern, Ukraine, Eastern, Eastern European countries, Ukraine, Georgia, Poland, they were highly susceptible and is still Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine is still very vulnerable from the NS2. But the final position, what is the result? The result is the Biden administration has signaled in a joint statement with the German, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the Biden administration signaled that yes, let it continue, start, and lift it, no, political sanction from, from the German company Nord Stream AG. So this is something, the reality. The Germany has finally constant its uh, a close ally to United States, that Russia is not going to muscle, Russia is not going to muscle itself. Uh, NS2, which is, which is, you know, which is starts from the Russian uh, through Baltic Sea into Germany. Germany is sure to stern, you know, European country, especially Ukraine, because Ukraine is a very vulnerable position. And Ukraine was assured by even the US, even by the Russian Federation that until 2024, Russia will continue. It's no continuous, you know, supply its gas to uh, Ukraine. So this is something unavoidable situation that, that establishes economic factor has a predominant role over the geopolitics. And again, it justified the complex independence of the new liberal theory of Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen. But my dear friend, 
There is another scenario. There is another story of international politics. The one theory is the realism. Realist theory. And I'm right now, I'm going to revert this assumption because realist theory does not believe in this economic, economic engagement. Deep economic engagement diffuses the power position, the power dominance, the power has many. This realist framework does not believe at all. Now I'm going to reverse this debate. And I will justify here that uh, realist presumption, realist uh, philosophy of international politics is still existed in the case of Russia and European Union. Let me start from 2000. On the onset of the new millennium, 2000, there is, a, there is a history of the coincidence of the rise of oil and gas, the price rise of the oil and gas, and the new leadership that Russia has acknowledged at Putin's arrival of Putinism. And the price rise of you know, oil and gas, it coincided. And soon after, within the four years, after the first term in 2004, Vladimir Putin started to restore its applied position, its glorified position. It started to signal the geopolitical masses to the superpower country like the United States. It started to challenge the unipolar position, military, economically unipolar position of the I'm talking about 2004. Only, only after the four years, Vladimir Putin used this oil and gas as a geopolitical leverage. And this is not something new for the Russian Federation. Before that, it was happened. But coincidentally for the Putin, Putin wanted to reassert its Russian position, Russian pride, Russian sense of pride, and he assured the Russian people, let me take forward the country on oil and gas. Let me delegitimize the ideological framework that was prevailed in the Cold War era. And initial, initial four years, United States was a partner of the Russian Federation. Let me remind you, 2001 incident, war on terror, both countries sex the hand against the war on terror. It was the Russia, Russian Federation which takes hand with the United States against the war on terror. Within the four years, Russia was along with the United States. And then the Russia uh, no, started feeling that, yes, Russia is gaining economic power. Russia started its mission. And 2007, in the Munich conference, Russia started its asserting position in Georgia, 2008. Russia started intervening U.S. hegemonic agenda in Syria and, of course, in Ukraine. She is in everywhere. Russia started setting its footprints each and everywhere to secure its position and challenging the hegemonic agenda of the Russian, uh, sorry, United States. So we can say, due to its natural gas position. 38 trillion cubic meters of natural gas reserves that makes it a highest reserves country across the world. Third producing oil country. And it, this is the skill set of the Putin's leadership. How skillfully he integrated this energy resources in terms of the political motives, yeah, political, yeah, geopolitical objectives. Each and every bear. But this is not the something historical. This is not something that new. Before the Russian Federation, we have seen in the history that the, this resource politics has been a tool uh, for a, a nation to advance the geopolitical in, uh, interest. Onwards from the Cold War era, Munro Doctrine, Marshall Plan of the United States. So we cannot say this is something new for the Russian Federation. Each and every country uses its leverage, economic leverages, into the political 
objectives. So this position, and again, uh, I'm, I'm just going to sum up my uh, uh, lecture in this uh, uh, last point that uh, this, uh, this geopolitical position, which I was establishing that yes, realistic assumption is still exist in the Russian position. The NS2 Nord Stream 2 was a geopolitical issue. Ukraine, no, Ukraine very categorically clear that Russia EU is going under the prism of more and more dependency on the Russian Federation. Even US along to European Union, you are going to under the under the, under the drop on the backdrop of Russian dependency. Even Putin, Vladimir, Russian President Vladimir Putin assured that Russia is not going to marshal its gas and oil and gas through this gas pipeline. However, there is apprehension, there is a doubt, and the, the doubt and the apprehension is based on the historical facts and the figures that cannot be denied. So this is all about my uh, today's lecture. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. And thank you so much, uh, George Santala. Thank you so much. Professor Sandip, thank you so much for your insightful and strong uh, words here on your topic. I believe that uh, we have a very good engagement with the next uh, uh, with the next topic that we are going to address here with Mr. Alexander Alexander Kormishin, as you were talking about in the interdependency and complex inter interdependency um, when it comes to um, energy uh, energy trade and energy uh, relations. Um, among countries uh, from the developed world and underdeveloped and uh, and developing countries, uh, Alexander Kormishin uh, is going to address uh, public awareness on energy cooperation. So uh, I think this links very well with his topic. Uh, I thank I thank you so much for your kind and your strong words here, uh, your critical view on the geopolitics of energy. Uh, very insightful, thank you so much. Professor Alexander, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Alexander Kormishin, uh, since 2015, uh, has led the BRICS initiative to create a youth dimension of the common energy agenda. Mr. Kormishin took leadership over the BRICS Youth Energy Agency in 2017. In 2020, Mr. Kormishin was included in the Advisory Council of the Russian Federation Agency for Humanitarian Cooperation. Under his leadership, the agency came along the way from a youth initiative to an internationally recognized organization which is responsible for youth energy studies and project development between BRICS countries. Alexander, uh, thank you so much once more for being with us. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please help yourself. We are very uh, interested in your, in your words, in your uh, speech uh, today. Thank you so much once more. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, so pleased to be with you today. And um, it's so great that you invited me to speak at the fifth BRICS conference organized by the University of Sao Paulo. It is not the first time I'm with you. Um, I was honored to participate last time. And I'm, I'm happy that uh, the G BRICS and BRICS YA are partners and we are um, moving the BRICS agenda together forward. So as for the... Um, BRICS energy uh, cooperation, I'd like to um, maybe introduce, first of all, the BRICS YA as the youth-led organization that is responsible for driving the youth energy agenda forward as a consolidating body for, um, on one side, um, energy-related authorities, and on the other side, the um, youth authorities 
of the BRICS countries. And we are also working with a broad cohort of uh, NGOs driving youth um, agenda. So um, in addition to that, um, let me just shortly cover the energy landscape that is um, has been shaped these days between BRICS countries. So um, all BRICS countries see energy as a priority area, also in accordance with the Sustainable Development Goals, which is prioritized by the Republic of India uh, under Indian presidency in BRICS. So um, energy has really come a long way since 2015 from almost nothing to something, um, because uh, not long time ago, the BRICS countries introduced the Energy Research Cooperation Platform as, um, let's say, mechanism for experts to work together and to exchange uh, information and also to produce analytical products so that BRICS countries have their own expertise in the field of national statistics and also their independent outlook on the things how the, um, let's say, the energy industry works and the whole. Um, forecast for the um, energy development of the world. So now the BRICS countries have this instrument, which is the BRICS uh, ERCP. Uh, BRICS countries have been uh, posting, let's say, the outlook since 2020 uh, under the Russian presence last year. Uh, the, uh, the platform released the first uh, BRICS energy report and the BRICS energy technology report. It was successfully succeeded by the Indian presidency, by the Ministry of Power uh, and uh, new, um, new energy and also renewables. Uh, so they released the uh, BRICS Energy Report and the BRICS Energy Technology Report and uh, the, the new publication, which is the uh, BRICS Energy Depository. Or, uh, so kind of uh, an outlet that has lots of contact persons from BRICS countries related to energy. So this is how it works. And um, so we are looking forward a lot to have the next um, year under the presidency of China in terms of energy. So um, this is just a whole uh, landscape about what's happening on this side. So BRICS countries see that um, energy is a priority area and especially in this year, taking the um, United Nations focus on the international energy cooperation. So um, this year, uh, there is a priority around the um, affordable and clean energy, which is in align, um, aligned with is the G7 uh, within the um, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, namely 2030 agenda. Uh, this year, BRICS countries prioritize the um, the United Nations High Level Dialogue on Energy, which was successfully held in September, and this is where uh, the BRICS leadership took part. Uh, the I mean the energy leadership, and also I was honored to participate in this event together with uh, some dignitaries representing uh, Schneider Electric and also the <clears throat> the Commonwealth. Namely, um, I participated there with uh, with Secretary General. So we both delivered our opinions about energy cooperation and a special role of young people in this agenda. So um, I wouldn't like to uh, stipulate a lot on the um, official BRICS agenda in terms of energy and wouldn't like to extend a lot of uh, things related, but I would like to dwell on the area of our uh, expertise of the BRICS Energy Agency, which is the Youth Energy Cooperation. This is where we've been working on, and uh, this might be also interesting for the panelists as well as the audience. Uh, BRICS YA has been driving energy agenda since 2015, it was right. So we released also our outlook, which is annually reviewed by the Ministers of Energy. The most successful edition is last year's edition, which is the BRICS Energy Outlook. You may check it online. And this year, um, we uh, decided not to hold our annual summit, which is a main platform for young uh, energy professionals to come together and discuss. So we, discussed, uh, we decided to prioritize the energy transition agenda and, the, um, and to leverage the climate agenda as well. You are all aware that this year the world is deciding uh, what to do next with our 
um, emission strategies and also special role of energy in this regard. And very soon, just tomorrow, I'm, I'm, I'm departing to Scotland, to Glasgow, uh, to further on participate in the COI 16 and COP26 events um, where BRICS countries will be also presented. And uh, BRICS YA has been driving a huge program related to, um, to the young people in the whole energy transition discussion. So it is quite huge. And uh, from our point of view, it's a little bit, well, um, let's say, politicized um, because BRICS countries have to take uh, even more courageous role. As, and from our point of view, BRICS countries have a lot of impact and one of the greatest potential to, to contribute to the climate goals and also to the climate uh, agreement uh, goals by 2050. And the young people uh, play a huge role in that. So a few months ago, we introduced the BRICS Youth Road to COP26. This is a huge line of events uh, which uh, shapes the mechanism for young people to participate in the talks and also the policy making around the energy transition and uh, the um, climate uh, policy. This is exactly in alignment with something that our BRICS countries are doing these days. For example, the Russian Federation has shaped working groups related to the energy transition. I'm aware that the Republic of India has been driving this agenda quite a lot under this um, national development plan. And uh, as well as China and South Africa, uh, the countries are committed to uh, reducing the um, carbon imprint um, uh, footprint in their energy balances and to increase the role of renewables and also the uh, um, the sources of energy that are not widely considered renewables like the nuclear energy, which is also green. So, and um, we are, um, as young people are working uh, in alignment with this um, priority set by our governments and including something new. So this is something new was, uh, um, would say reflected in our BRICS road to COP26. So where we take the priorities from all countries and putting them all together because young people these days are more global, globally thinking and they're trying to um, see, let's say, priorities of each of the countries. And um, so um, the goals are pretty common. The goal is to fight the climate change and to successfully um, implement the energy transition. And that's why we are um, in a very few days on the 30th of October, participating in drafting the global youth statement where the BRICS youth uh, opinion on the energy transition will be highlighted, which is also including the nuclear energy and the renewables, especially solar and wind. Um, it has also a special place for natural gas, which is um, a source which was mentioned by our previous speaker <clears throat> as one of the very important um, um, low carbon energy um, sources. And uh, of course, um, the BRICS countries do not forget about the traditional fossils that are, of course, um, carbon intensive. But taking the technologies that are available to BRICS countries, it is possible to, uh, to decrease the uh, carbon intensity of the energy sources like, um, like oil, for example, or coal. And this is especially important for China that is a vast uh, producer of coal, and this is no doubt, but will contribute to the uh, climate goals by 2050. And uh, a special role um, that BRICS youth has played in this, um, let's say, climate change agenda this year is that I believe BRICS YA is the only agency, BRICS agency, that's having BRICS events within the COP26 presidency. And young people are participating actively in this uh, by introducing the uh, youth recommendations for national guidelines um, to include young people into the climate change policy making. And we will be also introducing the CET board by BRICS Youth Energy Agency, which is a climate and energy transition board to have young energy professionals that are, uh, that are already into the processes of BRICS countries in the climate change agenda and also the relevant um, mechanisms uh, so that they could uh, work together 
um, as representatives of BRICS countries under the auspices of the BRICS YEA and to contribute their ideas and views uh, to their leadership through the official channels. So um, apparently um, I'm, go I'm not going to take much of your time. And um, so um, basically that's it, what we are going. And uh, apparently by the end of the year, we'll be also engaging with BRICS youth on the questions of energy uh, if we um, eventually have the BRICS youth uh, as the chief forum, which is a tradition. And um, I would like to invite you all to participate uh, also in our events on the road to COP, and especially on the event, which is to take place on the 5th of November uh, in Glasgow. Um, it's also possible to participate virtually, um, but um, it's incredibly important that BRICS experts and young people are participating in this agenda and delivering the view at a group of five countries, which is a great, great thing because BRICS are um, leading the developing world and um, they are considered as the voices, uh, strong voices to, uh, to defend their position as the developing world. So thank you very much. I wish uh, best of luck to, uh, to everyone and thank you very much to the organizers for this fantastic event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alexander. Uh, you covered so many topics in, in a few minutes. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible skill. <laughs> uh, I envy you. <laughs> and well, uh, it, what, is, what is interesting is that also uh, the topics you covered uh, uh, builds, uh, they build a, a lead to our next panel as well, because um, we were, you were discussing here, uh, energy transition, green energy, uh, global goals, and all those topics that maybe, I don't know if uh, precisely they, they will be uh, uh, addressed by the next panelist, but uh, Mr. Pui Matt will be addressing energy mix so uh, having all those uh, energy uh, production uh, uh, efforts uh, may be may build some energy mix uh, that will be, of course, uh, necessary for all countries that are engaging into uh, industrial revolution or are trying to evolve uh, in their in their national landscapes and and and, and build better uh, and build better uh, not only business but build better build better uh, uh, make people's lives better because energy is very important for everyone. So uh, let me introduce to you all our next panelist, um, uh, Professor Piwi Matt. Did I pronounce it correctly, Mr. Piwi? Yes, yes, the pronunciation is correct, but I'm not a <laughs> professor yet, just to correct that. <laughs> great, great. Pui uh, Matt um, has extensive and varied leadership experience gained in the University of Free State UFS, covering multiple portfolios, including SRC president from 2013-2014, uh, residence committee chairman, RC Finance, Mentorship, and Executive Member in multiple student associations and clubs. He participated as a panelist at prestigious events organized by the Man Mangaung Metropolitan Municipality in the Anti-Racist Network in Higher Education and the British Council. He has extensive social sector and public sector volunteer experience covering justice, education, and healthcare across the Free State Province and working with the Free State Provincial Department of Education and the UFS Institute for Reconciliation and Social and Social Justice. He is an experienced debater, adjudicator, and mentor who has an interest in current affairs, sport, traveling, strategic planning, and reading, which is very good always. <laughs> Fury holds a BA in governance and political transformation. 
Mr. Fiwi, thank you once more for being here with us. It's such an honor to have you in our panel and to have the South African view on such an important issue uh, in global. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a global concern. So it's very good to hear news from South Africa on those topics. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Mr. Piwi. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I must say that uh, the, the two previous speakers covered a lot of the topics, but what I will do is just come in between uh, and sort of give off the South African experience, because uh, as you would know that uh, South Africa among the BRICS member states is the only African country that is there. So we also bring a dynamic of what is happening in the African continent as well, because issues of energy in the African continent are not only about issues of access to energy, but also they are linked to the question of eradication of poverty, because there's a lot, there's a big industry around the energy industry, which could be of great benefit to a lot of young Africans in the continent. As you would know, population wise, we also have a very huge population boom of young people on the continent. And so industries such as the energy industry with the new innovations that are coming in are some of the opportunities that are there for us to be able to create many more economic spin-offs and deal with the question of the eradication of poverty. But let me get quickly into the presentation. Uh, I'm Piwe Mate, as it has been said, another director for social and economic transformation of the South African BRICS Youth Association. The South African BRICS Youth Association essentially is more or less uh, an association for young people that represents and advocates for policy positions at the level of BRICS through um, the South African government and other multilateral institutions, not only in South Africa, but also in the continent. And our position with regards to the question of energy is that young people, because we are a young association, association of, of youth representing young people on, the, on South Africa, but by extension, the continent, we believe that young people are the most affected uh, demographic when it comes to the world's rising socioeconomic and political and environmental crisis. Yet young people are also the best placed to lead the transition because the discussion right now about energy and technology is mainly centered around the future. And we cannot uh, you know, deal with the future without speaking about the role of young people through that transition. And uh, through a matured form of activism, they are best place to guide action towards a much more inclusive future. Now, BRICS countries uh, have expressed their aspiration to stimulate strong economic and social support within the multilateral trading system. And this obviously would require, because of the topic and its relevance, this would obviously uh, be in line with intensifying interaction in the fields of climate change and enabling sustainable energy consumption and energy generation to enhance the quality of human life and human capital, and which is one of the goals that we have as, a, as, as, as BRICS countries, which is the eradication of poverty, as well as solving issues of land and water pollution as well. Now, um, we also believe that uh, it's imperative and it's quite a good standpoint that was taken by BRICS countries to encourage uh, BRICS member states to use low carbon technologies and to develop special instruments to stimulate such incentives. We've noted some of the developments that have come from China. I mean, in South Africa, we're also quite big in terms of solar energy because there's a lot of sunlight that comes in. And there's been a lot of technology that has been developed with regards to that, that has mainly come from China. So a lot of the BRICS countries have already helped on to the boom in terms of the production of all of these things. But I will not want to get into the question of the imports and the exports of energy produces and technologies for now, but I'll just touch on some of the light topics in relation to the topic that I've chosen. Now, uh, the term energy mix obviously refers to the combination of the various primary energy sources that are used to meet the energy needs given in a geographic region. Now, when we look at South Africa, South Africa, uh, in South Africa, coal is the mainstay of the South African energy system and it meets around 70% of the installed power generation capacity that we have in the country. And what's interesting about South Africa as well, and why it's such a critical partner within the BRICS uh, trading bloc, is that South Africa 
also accounts for about 12% of the economic activity in all of Africa and about 30% of the electricity demand on the continent as well. So South Africa has also got huge energy demands that are coming through it. And so it's quite imperative for it to also join the quest to have low carbon and sustainable energy that is there. How, uh, however, you would know that also in South Africa, we've also had an issue with regards to our energy generation as well. We've had instances of where we've had to build and maintain our power stations, which have aged quite a lot. And we're in a, quite a level where we have to build new power stations as well. Now, this has also left us in a bit of a dilemma when it comes to energy, because the load keeps on increasing as the population keeps on rising. Um, so currently, South Africa is, the most, is among the most energy intensive economies on the African continent. Now, the current energy mix of South Africa is mainly dominated by coal and oil and accounts for about 80% of the almost 50 gigawatts of the coal-fired capacity on the continent. Now, that in its own also puts South Africa in a very uh, precarious position, especially in the African continent as being guilty, as being one of the countries that is guilty in terms of contributing to, 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 to the pollution of the air and also is one of the guilty countries when it comes to greenhouse emissions because of our reliance on coal. So these are some of the things that the South African government had noted through the BRICS multilateral forums. I think it was also cited by the two previous speakers about the agreements that were reached in 2019. And in 2019, South African government also adopted an integrated resource plan, which sets out a long-term diversification of the power mix by the year 2030, and a move towards um, lightening the carbon footprint of the energy sector while meeting the growing energy demand and ensuring that there's socioeconomically just transition that we have to make. Now, the composition of the, the, the energy mix that we speak of in the South African continent, and very broadly, uh, it varies greatly from one country to one region and, and can change significantly depending on the period in which you are in. Some of these variables, which are very key especially now because we're talking about developing countries. These, we we're talking about countries that do not necessarily have big economies or access to big markets. Now the availability of usable resources domestically and the possibility of importing them is one of the variables that contribute to the question of the energy mix. I will bring another close example to the African continent where the availability of resources in terms of financial resources might be quite limited, but you would find that in most instances, the kind of natural resources that are required in order to be able to produce the kind of energy would be there. However, they would need to be investment in terms of the energy infrastructure to be able to transform that and be able to generate power. Now, the extent of the type of energy that needs to be met is also another fact. And given the numbers that are on the continent, it would be quite reasonable to expect that you could build quite a variable industry that caters for this. Now, the second one I think was touched on by the first speaker is around the policy choices that determine uh, the question of the energy mix or the variables. Now around policy choices, you know, they're mainly determined by the historical, the economic, the social, the demographic, the environmental, and also the geopolitical factors as well that are there. I would have wanted to also go into the geopolitical factors, but I think the first speaker did justice when it came to the geopolitical factors, I must say, that we were all quite well prepared. But also on the issue of, 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 of these policy choices, uh, like when we come to uh, the South African example, for example, um, when it came to the policy question, it was also an issue of how do we within the, the South African context and being such a, a heavy producer and so heavily reliant on energy on the continent, how do we from a socioeconomic perspective begin to bring in other energy producers? But the question obviously around quote policy questions becomes another political one where the question would be who do we invite to be the people that come in and become the alternative power producers because you've got power producers that are already playing in Europe and then you've got power producers that are local, but how do you bring the two together whilst ensuring that you are growing the economy and providing opportunities for the domestic economy as well when it comes to issues of energy. Now, um, drought as well as severe storms and wild temperature swings are some of the things that have affected Africa as a result of global warming. And this is very real. 
and, and energy plans um, for the future should be around how do we lower the collective footprint that is here to meet our energy demands. Now, prime conditions exist uh, within the African continent. However, the issue of infrastructure that is there is also another issue that would require greater and broader investment among BRICS countries in order to be able to cooperate in bringing uh, and realizing Africa's or South Africa's future energy mix. But with the energy mix, we cannot talk about energy mix on its own as it being isolated. With the energy mix, there's always the transition, you know, which is called the energy transition. And for developing countries, there are these common challenges that they all face, which is one of the first things that they face is that there is no single mix that could be ideal worldwide. So each and every country would have to find out what is it that works best for them. Although major international climate summits um, like the COP21, COP19, COP that was once hosted in South Africa, sought to adopt global objectives around the energy transition, you know, with specifications to each and every country. But we all know that energy systems by their very nature are not very dynamic, meaning that an energy process or transition in one country can take longer than it would in a different other country. And that is why in the case of South Africa, the targets that have been set, we've set a target for the year 2030, which is quite a long process that many would argue. But given the space that we're in, because we adopted it in 2019, it is, it is, it is, it makes sense for that for, for our country in particular and for many African countries, given the social economic and the size of the economy that is there. But another critical issue as well is about energy security. Now this obviously deals with the reliability of the energy supply that must be ensured to meet current and future demand. And this is also tied to the question of investor confidence, especially in a country like South Africa. Many investors that come and want to invest in a country like South Africa that is quite industrialized, that's got a lot of mining activity um, from platinum mining, coal mining, gold mining, which is quite intensive in terms of the energy side, would want to know that you know, the energy supply would be secured and it would be consistent as it affects their business. Currently, as we sit here, uh, a lot of businesses in South Africa are losing a lot of money as a result of load shedding, which is energy supply that is not consistent and reliable at this point in time. So when we speak of the energy transition, there's also the fact of guaranteeing what is called energy security as well. But moving along to another concept as well, which is very key when we speak of the challenges of energy transition is energy equity. You know, the fact that energy must be accessible around the world and within the different localities of a particular country, especially in emerging markets and at an affordable cost. Now, in a country like South Africa, for example, where there's vast inequalities and people being able to afford energy, in the context of bringing in new energy innovations and new technologies, you would need to be able to balance that with ensuring that those that are not as privileged as others are still able to access basic amenities like, 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 like electricity, for example. So with this country like South Africa that has a very large social welfare program where we provide social security grants, we provide water to indigents, which are people who are unemployed, and we also provide housing and electricity unto them. It is also quite imperative that the state now begins to play a very critical role in sort of trying to balance and ensure that there's a certain level of energy equity. Now for developing countries, this is also a very tricky situation when it comes to the energy transition. And this is something that we need to balance whenever they're going about it. But there's also the question of environmental sustainability as well. You would know that there's been a huge debate around nuclear energy, which has been a very controversial topic in South Africa. Um, however, nuclear energy has been said to be the safest sources of energy and already makes up a 6% of South Africa's energy mix, you know, and with only one nuclear power station that we have in the country and on the continent, you know, by the way, which is based in, in Cape Town, nuclear energy obviously is uh, some of the, the is, is one of the alternatives that has been, has been discussed, but there are a lot of concerns about the impact that it has on the environment you know, and the concerns surrounding non-renewable sources of energy is due to the issue of radioactive waste that is produced by non-renewable sources of energy. So there's still those issues of 
environmental sustainability. You know, now energy efficiency and the development of renewable low greenhouse gas and other sources has also been on the table um, in as far as South Africa is concerned because gas has also been muted. In fact, natural gas has also been muted as one of the most environmentally friendly fossil fuels due to its low CO2 carbon emissions per unit of energy. Now, in fact, it's, it's a lot less harmful to the environment than it would be with the current you know, petroleum and coal that is being used in the country. Now that has also been mooted as, 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 as one of the, the, the alternatives that we have that we're going to be integrated into the question of the energy mix of South Africa. But then there's also what I initially hinted on, which is solar power, which is by far one of the front runners in terms of the renewable energy resources, because there's also been a huge push for the implementation of it in South Africa, in, in South Africa and across other countries uh, in the continent, but particularly in the SADC region. Now, its popularity has come with huge advancements in technology, as I highlighted, because solar energy is now cheaper you know, than coal in many countries across the world. And you know that given the fact that we're on the African continent, we have a lot of sunlight compared to other continents as well that we experience. So it is one of the key front runners that we're looking at when it comes to the issue of energy mix. So the transition to make it into solar would not be as difficult, but for a developing country that does not have the kind of expertise and technological skills to produce these kinds of things, we find that they would be dependent, you know, on countries such as China to be able to actually produce that kind of technology. But in the process of the production of the technology, there also needs to be a balance in terms of the sharing of skills so that there's capacity that can be developed for those countries that mainly import some of that technology that comes in. So the prediction is that solar power will soon be the most cost-effective energy power, not only in the country, but also in the world. And certain advances have already been made. Uh, in most of the houses that are built by the South African government, they have a model, a standard model that they use of geysers, which normally heat warm water that are, are, are solar heated. And that has also been quite successful. But then again, it comes down to the issue of pricing again for a country that is also marred by questions of inequality and high rising levels of unemployment. So the question of energy mix really um, does require support you know, amongst all BRICS countries. And it is a good thing that there's collaboration amongst BRICS countries when it comes to the question of the energy transition and industrial revolution as well. And I think the BRICS Bank is also quite a key, the BRICS Development Bank is also quite a key institution that could be able to unlock these opportunities and unlock opportunities in the energy industry for mainly um, companies that would come in from South Africa, but mainly for the youth. Because uh, in, a country, in, in, in the African continent, the youth constitutes about over 50% of the population. And the youth is the youth that has acquired skills, but it is a youth that is also needs to break out into other frontiers and other industries in order for, it, for us to reach some level of just social economic equity to be uh, exact. So the question of energy mix without wasting a lot of time, because most of the colleagues have gone through a lot of the points, mainly deals with the question of the challenges related to the transition into you know, uh, the utilization of those energy mix alternatives and what developing countries or, you know, uh, less developed economies like South Africa have been doing across that front and some of the challenges that we are faced with as developing countries among the BRICS trading bloc. So it's quite key that at the level of, 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 of BRICS, there's a youth formation that's actually trying to deal with these issues so that we consolidate the perspectives of the future and be able to give guidance to the sustainability and the reliable production of renewable energy that is safe and that can also preserve our environment for generations to come. So with those words, uh, the chairperson of the session or program director, thank you very much for the platform. We appreciate it on behalf of the South African BRICS Youth Association, and uh, I will be accepting any questions from you. Thanks. Professor Piwi, thank you so much for your very insightful presentation. It was really good. Uh, I, I, I wish all uh, BRICS authorities uh, would be watching this, uh, this particular panel and our whole event because we have discussed here 
very important issues uh, for policy builders, for policy makers uh, in BRICS countries, uh, because we have uh, a Sandeep uh, brought uh, the Indian perspective, the Indian um, uh, challenges, just as Pee Wee uh, defined here and, and, and traced a, a very good analysis on, on how uh, Africa uh, needs support on, on energy um, on energy uh, development. Uh, Alexander also uh, brought us many efforts and many ideas on how uh, cooperation among BRICS countries and uh, inside the global community as a whole uh, is important to engage uh, these projects, to engage um, uh, energy development, uh, particularly in developing countries, and how this is important for global development. So uh, I, I wish really from the bottom of my heart that BRICS policy members, uh, the policymakers are watching this. Uh, we are going to send them an email with the link for this presentation and for the whole, uh, of course, for the whole uh, event, for the whole conference. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I'm really amazed about uh, everything that was uh, said uh, in this panel. Um, I have, uh, we have here maybe uh, two or three minutes for uh, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, and those two questions were made uh, directly to Mr. Pui, but I think that we may discuss the, this uh, among us all. Uh, if we have uh, enough time, at least two of them. Uh, the first one I would like to discuss is, uh, was made by Professor Cassio, <laughs> who's here with us. And he said, uh, uh, how can we, how can we uh, uh, conciliate, how can we conciliate environmental needs in all of our countries here? Africa, India, South Africa, Russia. Uh, the environmental needs and the development needs and the development goals when it comes to energy. Uh, what can we do to diminish the, the problems with environmental issues, such as when you build a dam, like what happened in the Nile Dam, or here in Brazil with many dams as we have here, um, and the environmental problems that happen from the from it, for example, the uh, uh, the floods and, and everything uh, like this. Uh, in your perspective, Sandy, Pui, and Alexander, um, what the governments in your countries, how how the governments and how the policymakers look at those uh, of, at uh, those uh, both issues, how they look at it. Uh, do they consider only? Oh no, we are going to we are going to do it regardless environment, or we are not doing this because of the environment, or how they manage, how they conciliate those two important issues that we must preserve. Sandeep, if you want to start. Uh, so thank you so much again, <clears throat> uh, Professor Ajun Shinantala, for uh, this question. And this is a, a very abundant and uh, uh, important question for today's uh, discussion, especially in the, this uh, session. Uh, uh, as far as India is concerned, so Indian government is a highly conscious, uh, is a high, very, a very, very uh, conscious about uh, uh, renewable energy. And when we talk about the renewable energy, uh, that means it is a signal that we are very, very close to environmental protection. And historically, India has been a signatory of all international treaties. Uh, 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 for example, the current treaty, like Paris uh, Accord, uh, so Paris Conference for the Environmental Protection. So India, uh, India has been a member and is still as a very committed country uh, to protect environment uh, as well as uh, uh, to ensure uh, energy. Uh, that's why the Indian government is uh, uh, engaging uh, BRICS countries uh, to discover uh, those um, uh, mechanisms 
uh, that could be that can be achieved in energy security, especially uh, that uh, few and like Jinder both mentioned about the solar energy. So Indian government is you know working on that solar energy. And let me tell you uh, one fact that is very uh, satisfactory you know, <clears throat> moment for us that Indian government is exp uh, no, ex expanding to the grassroots level this solar energy. And almost uh, in the remote uh, villages in the remote area of the India, each and every state, uh, government is highly sensitive to, uh, you know, uh, to expand it, uh, to, to, to propagate it, uh, even to convince the people the how it is, 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 it is a condition for us, how it is uh, you know, reasonable for us, how it is uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a source of that is uh, long standing, that might be long standing, that might be cheapable, that might be accessible, that might be affordable. So accessibility, affordability, and availability are the three options in this looking for that, in this working on that uh, uh, through uh, engagement with the BRICS countries and, also, uh, and, and other forums also. But it is highly committed uh, to, you know, uh, to force this, uh, to proceed this, to promote this uh, uh, renewable energy and to protect environmental law, environmental era. Thank you so much. Professor Piwi, any comments? Thank you very much. I think the question, uh, I think the one that was directed to me was about the energy crisis and its interference with the eradication of poverty. Uh, look, the, the availability of energy, we need, we, need, we need a lot of energy in an economy. You need, an, basically energy is one of the key things that you need in an economy especially in an economy that's highly industrialized. And once you have an economy that's industrialized, I mean, jobs are mainly driven by an economy that's industrialized and employment also results as a result of that. So for a, an economy that is highly industrialized like that of South Africa and quite a number of other countries, we can mention also Nigeria as well. In the event that you do not have sustainable energy supply, that is reliable or energy supply that is not equitably available, you run the risk of eliminating about certain sections of your population from being able to access the most basic things. That means there won't be a market for things such as digital devices. There won't be a market for electrical appliances. There won't be markets for quite a number of things. And you would know that whenever we speak about jobs and the economy, there have to be markets that are created for people to come and invest within you know, those markets and for there to be employment and job creation and growth. So opportunities that also exist in different sectors for the locals within that particular country. I mean, uh, we could have a look at the South African situation where we've got quite a number of energy companies that have been, you know, conducting commercial operations. Now, the existence of these kinds of companies that produce you know, uh, different, uh, you know, energy sources to the power grid of South Africa are the ones that also employ a lot of South Africans as well. So it's quite critical that we do not look at poverty and energy as being two things that are isolated. These are things that are, that are mutually inclusive. In fact, one is a byproduct of the other. So it is essentially about the question of the economy, growing the economy and economic transformation and being able to deal with the eradication of poverty as well. So the two cannot be separated at all. And hence, we cannot speak of one without also mentioning the other. Well, great. Thank you so much, Biwi. Uh, thank you so much for all participants and all um, uh, everybody that's watching us on YouTube for the questions, for the participation, for the engagement with our panel. Uh, it was a great pleasure to hear you both and to hear also Professor Alexander. He had to, he had a flight to pick up a flight, so he had to, to leave us a little bit early. Uh, I am thanking you once more, Sandeep, Piwi, and Alexander, for kind participation on our conference in, in this particular panel. I would like to invite everybody to join us in our next events. Today, we are going to have uh, uh, two more panels, uh, two more panels, a public opinion and BRICS that will be starting at 7 p.m. 
uh, and Global Health and Bricks that will be starting 8.30 p.m. So don't miss, don't miss our next uh, panels of our conference. And uh, it's an honor to, to be here with you to moderate this panel. And once more, on behalf of Gebrick Suspi, on behalf of the University of Sao Paulo, on behalf of Professor Paulo Barba Casella, I thank you all. And I uh, finish this panel with a, with a huge hand for you both and for Mr. Alexander. Thank you so much. Thank you were wonderful. We are sending this to the policymakers. They must thank hear you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.